Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. An emotional homecoming decades in the making. As a new hawk totem pole returns to Bella Coola 100 years later. Also, winter weather heading our way. The last gasp of winter with big snowfall events even down to the south coast. With warnings of frigid temperatures and snowfall in the week ahead. And calls for support. Putting the money in the black community is really, really important now, tomorrow, and <laughs> other days. Black business owners hit hard by rising costs. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Michelle Gassoub. Anita is away tonight. We begin with an emotional moment for a community in BC's north. A new hawk totem pole returned to Bella Coola after it was taken to Victoria more than 100 years ago. The CBC's Susanna De Silva joins us now. She's in Bella Coola. Susanna, what's happening now? Well, you can't see it, but just down the hall from where I am here in the lobby of the high school where the totem pole was brought and will remain for the next year, there is a big community feast happening. Too bad you can't smell it. It smells delicious in here, but there is a big feast to end the day of what has been a lot of celebration, a lot of sadness as well, reflection upon what this community has lost. But for many, they are looking at what happened today as really a new beginning. After years of fighting, weeks of planning, the moment finally came today for the totem pole to be unveiled here. The majority of the members of the New Hawk Nation have never seen it before, and it was inside of the gym. It was covered in a colorful cloth. Elders and hereditary chiefs surrounded it, and they then revealed the pole to the community, and there really was a silence that engulfed the crowd that was there, a reverence really for this pole, a member of their community they consider that has returned. There were prayers said over it, and the community itself was then in invited to get a closer look of this pole that dates to before the time that BC was declared a colony. Now there are speeches continuing, dances throughout the afternoon. There will be a feast here tonight to celebrate this. And for many here, they see this as a sign of strength of the community, that the community is fighting back. It is regaining all of the things they have lost over the decades through things like residential schools, even the young people here say this is an important event happening in this community. That poll will remain here at the school for the next year. A chance again for the young people, for the kids to get a look at it, appreciate that history, but then it will head back to the original village site of the Newhawk people, where they say it will be allowed to return to the ground as is the community tradition. But many say this event and what has happened through this will live on forever because of that totem pole. And so they are hoping, they're looking now at some sort of a display case that they could put up here in the school again. So as the kids come in, they can develop that appreciation before it does head back to that village. And, you know, there has been discussion about whether or not that is what it is, what should be done. But it is a family totem pole. It had been originally at the front of the longhouse. It then was a grave marker. And they say they feel, the family feels that that is the place that it should go back to, to carry out, as I said, that tradition of returning a totem pole to the ground. Michelle? The CBC's Susanna De Silva reporting live from Bella Coola tonight. Thanks, Susie. The Tsushop First Nation will be releasing the phase one results of an investigation into the grounds around Alberni Indian Residential School tomorrow. The nation used ground penetrating radar around the school following the discovery of potential unmarked graves at other sites across the country. Renee Filipponi has more. Behind me is one of the remaining buildings of the Alberni Indian Residential School on the Sushat First Nation on Vancouver Island. The school was in operation from 1900 until it closed in 1973. Now research done by the First Nation found that children from up to 100 communities across the province were forced to attend this school. Now following the 2021 discovery of more than 200 potential graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School, people here started to talk, sharing stories about their experiences and memories that included helping to dig graves. So 
18 months ago, the community started its own investigation into the grounds around the school using ground penetrating radar and other similar technologies that are being used across the country in First Nations communities. Now, the elected chief counselor says the news that's expected in the release of these phase one results can be difficult for survivors and their loved ones. He says they never consented to having this residential school on their territory, but are doing their part to educate the world about what happened here. Finding the truth and sharing it with the world is crucial for survivors, but so is justice. You know, our, our mind, our soul, you know, like we lost so much in that school. You know, we were deprived of our family. We were deprived of love. We were deprived of um, culture. We were deprived of our language. We were deprived of uh, nourishing food. And uh, I'm 72 and I'm surprised I'm still alive. The chief counselor hopes these preliminary findings will provide survivors and the nation with the knowledge it needs to continue this important work. The community has provided counseling and support in the lead up to this announcement, and they will have people on site as long as they're needed. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Seychat, First Nation. The mercury is set to drop this week. Winter still has its icy grip on much of BC. And as Zara Premji explains, it might not be the last time for the season. Damp days aren't unusual for the south coast at this time of year, but that rain is just the beginning of cool weather coming our way as winter is flexing its muscles again this week. And it's the fifth cold snap of this type that we've seen since November. And this time, no matter what part of the province you're in, be warned. So nobody will escape the, the colder than normal conditions. A snowfall warning has been issued for the Coquihalla Highway from Hope to Merritt, with snowfall of 25 to 30 centimetres expected near the summit by Tuesday morning and tremendous travel concerns on the highway. As weather warnings pepper the province, Avalanche Canada forecasters also tell CBC snow and strong wind will increase avalanche danger, which sits at high for parts of the province. And beyond that... We'll start to see that really on Wednesday will be kind of the plunge uh, into those colder temperatures for the south coast, uh, earlier than that for the interior and the north in particular. And Thursday and Friday are expected to be the coldest days. Cities are preparing for the unhoused population to have a warm place to shelter. City of Victoria is among the regions opening up overnight warming shelters. City of Vancouver also opening not only warming centres, but additional shelter spaces for Monday evening and potentially more days based on how deep the temperatures dip. Environment Canada says while this is the fifth cold snap since November. People need to be just aware that this is coming so that they're not thinking about daffodils quite yet. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. And for more on this blast of winter, senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. Uh, Joe, as we just saw in Zara's piece, we are certainly not out of the woods yet. You're right, Michelle. And it is usually, at least, you know, the past few decades wise, the end of February that we see that last blast of winter. But we are in a La Nina year, which is why we've had these rounds of uh, snow that will continue along with these cold temperatures. I want to show you the big picture on the satellite right now, because this system that's bringing the snow across the province is also in part dragging down that cold air. And this system is what's bringing those warnings tonight. You just saw briefly that Environment Canada warning map. The snowfall extends from Kitimat Terrace across to Prince George, down through Columbia into the Kootenays and the Coquihalla also under that warning. Meanwhile, for Metro Vancouver, we're under a special weather statement for gusty winds tonight. And you can see the west side of the island under that wind warning. We are seeing wind gusts right now across Metro Vancouver over 50 kilometers per hour as that cold front swings through. We'll see those winds remain gusty through the overnight and into tomorrow morning. And then we'll be left with a northwesterly flow. So Michelle, we'll really start to feel those cold temperatures midweek. I'll break it all down coming up. Okay, we will check in with you a little later. Thanks, Joe. Black History Month often brings a boost for black business owners, but many owners are urging customers to continue that support year-round. As Yasmin Gandam reports, owners say the need is greater than ever. It's been a hard road, just like having to discount everything. 
Tilda Ravinga owns a fashion design company, but she has been forced to close her business due to a sharp decline in support. It's, it was really heartbreaking to close my business. I'm still in the process of closing it. I'm not, I haven't like shut down completely. I still have like a bunch of stuff I need to sell. Ravinga says she hasn't sold anything in months, a stark contrast from 2021 when her business saw a 300% surge in sales during the peak of the Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter. I had like a lot of mixed emotions when it was happening. I was like, are people only doing this because they feel bad? Are they only supporting me because they feel bad? Or is it because they actually like want to support me as a person? Others say it's not enough for people to show their support during Black History Month, but to actively seek out black businesses like this fashion designer who uses her colorful and printed clothing to pay homage to her Nigerian heritage intentionally like intentionally going out to support black businesses finding them online because you can also get to you can get lost in the midst of everything but using the hashtag trying to find black businesses and trying to support them um like putting the money in the black community is really really important now tomorrow and <laughs> other days to come a survey by Statistics Canada found that in 2022, 35% of Black-owned businesses indicated they were in a worse position than during the Black Lives Matter movement. That's compared to 27% for all businesses as a whole. Inflation is causing, um, a, you know, hardship on Canadians and everyone's trying to save a dollar where they can. So I think that that is also being reflected into, um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of sales for, for black owned businesses. Amid the financial hardship, some people have found creative ways to support the black community. This tattoo artist has been raising money to tattoo black folks for free in February. Historically, um, it's been harder for black people to access tattoos. There's a lot of racism in the industry. And also with Black History Month, it comes with a lot of grief and a lot of um, you know, family trauma that you're learning about and ancestral trauma. And I just want to do something nice for the community. Moving forward, these business owners are asking customers to think of them year round, a movement they're calling Black 365. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, Vancouver. The Okanagan is quickly becoming the go-to place for dozens of Christmas cable and TV movies. The Okanagan Film Commission reported 6% growth last year, while the Lower Mainland posted less than a percent for the same period. The boom is driven by the extra provincial film tax credit given to locations beyond hope. And this has led to increased production of holiday romances in the Okanagan. The Okanagan Film Commissioner says his office is currently courting a big screen blockbuster this summer. A dispute between residents and disc golfers in North Vancouver has landed in front of City Council. As Yasmin Ghania reports, the complaints range from overcrowding, public urination and verbal abuse in Eastview Park. Chris Vance loves playing disc golf at Eastview Park with his family. Stay in the air. Stay in the air. Too far. Too far. Oh. Actually, too far. It's a simple game requiring minimal equipment and you can play all year round with friends and family. Yeah, look at the flight on that. But not everyone is a fan. For years, some residents have complained about unruly behavior by some players. And they say it's gotten worse since the sport gained popularity during the pandemic. Yeah, I think we've heard about drinking in the park. Um, we've heard about um, smoking of cannabis in the park. Uh, we've heard about like public urination and, and uh, defecation. There are also reports of people and their dogs being hit with discs. A few residents recently brought their concerns to city councillors. It's not a case that if an accident's going to happen and a child get injured, it's when it's going to happen. And you guys have the power yeah. to stop Thank that you. happening. But some players say the conflict is being blown out of proportion. We do have a couple of blind corners. Majority of people are really well aware of that and when they throw, they're, they're cognizant and they're looking. Nobody wants to hit anybody, a disc will hurt. Councillors have passed a motion for city staff to look at solutions that would address the problem, including possibly relocating the disc golf course to another park. Chris Vance says closing this location would be disappointing since it's the perfect size for his kiddos. 
the kids can see the basket from the tee pad, so it's so much more fun for them. This to me is the family park. City staff will present council with a report outlining options for the park in the coming weeks. But for now, disc golf lives on. Yasmin Rene, CBC News, North Vancouver. Canada's favorite sport, but with a twist. We take you inside the unlikely game of underwater hockey. That's next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. This Black History Month, we'd like to introduce an avid hockey card collector. Dean Barnes has collected the rookie cards of more than 100 black and biracial players who appeared in at least one NHL game. Now he plans to share the cards and their stories with others. sort of attuned to what was going on in the world with uh, some of the injustices with the George Floyd situation. So I finished off the 7980 collection, had my Wayne Gretzky, and then I started to purchase other cards like Grant Fuhrer, who was an NHL Hall of Famer, uh, played for Edmonton Oilers, and also um, Jerome McGinley. And those were my first two purchases of NHL Black Hockey players. I'm Dean Barnes. I'm the creator of the NHL Black Hockey Card Collection. Hockey, there's not as much visible presence in the game right now, but historically, my collection's um, very helpful in the way that shows 100 players. So that's a lot of players who have played since Willie O'Ree stepped on the ice since 1958. Looking back now, I just really appreciate the fact that I, I knew who some of those players were, and now um, dawning on the fact that there's 100 who have played uh, in the game, I think it's really great for kids to have um, that many stars that they can look up to. Where can people see this collection? I started a website uh, a year ago with my daughters. It's called uh, BlackHockeyCards.com. So it shows a re visual representation of all the players. There's close-ups of the cards, and it shows the historical sequence of the older players to the younger players. This year, they're in the United uh, by Mobile Hockey History Museum. And um, I coordinated with some other collectors. One's uh, Indigenous, uh, Asian, and Hispanic. And we have 40 cards in the Tory in the Museum from every NHL city. And um, each of those cards have a significant um, significance to them. So for example, uh, Grant Fuhrer is in my collection. He won five Stanley Cups. He's in the Hall of Fame. Once you started sharing these cards, people were really interested in the stories behind them as well. And I understand you're starting a podcast. I just want to be a part of the team and play the game that I love. But because I show up in this black skin, the whole you know, effort is, 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 is drawn my way. The podcast is an opportunity to tell um, the story about the players and bring the cards to life. It's called My Hockey Hero. You know, stories are very helpful because they help connect people, they help include people, and I think there's a lot of people that would be really uplifted by the stories that these, story these players have to share about their journey in hockey. I hope that if someone wants to play the game of hockey, this might inspire them. Um, and I think hearing the stories of different uh, things players have overcome and their successes in life, I just think that it's a good thing for us to um, open the game up and be more inviting and more intentional. And this might be something that's very inspiring for people to, to see themselves in the game. rainfall in Brazil has killed dozens of people, including a seven-year-old girl, while many more are missing. The rain fell on several coastal cities, triggering flooding and landslides. Julia Wong has more on the search for survivors. The destruction after the deluge in Brazil's Sao Paulo state. Streets flooded, homes destroyed after two months' worth of rain fell in just 24 hours. Survivors grateful to have escaped with whatever they could carry. It was an avalanche close to the building, this woman says. My mother and brother's vehicles were damaged. Thank God we survived. 
The worst hit was the city of Sao Sebastio. Its mayor posted this video showing residents in a mud-covered street forming a human chain to rescue children. The situation is extremely critical, says the mayor. The forecast is for heavy rain, and at this moment there's still a lot of debris. The hills are still slippery. We still have houses at risk, and the big concern at this moment is to rescue people who are still in the rubble. Rescues like this, of a mother and her newborn baby from a beach. They were taken to a nearby hospital. Teams are trying to help. But mud and debris are getting in the way. We are still evaluating the size of the problem, and it's serious, says the state's governor. It rained a lot. We have many landslides. The Santos River is completely blocked, which impairs access to some communities. Brazil's president viewed the destruction Monday from the air and pledged his support. I can guarantee that my ministers will be ready to dialogue, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva says, so we can partner to recover. Recover from the rain that wreaked this havoc and prepare. More is on the way. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Another earthquake has rattled the border region of Turkey and Syria, killing at least three people and injuring at least 200. The quake was centered near the city of Antakya and was a magnitude 6.3. That's not as strong as the earthquakes two weeks ago, which resulted in the deaths of 47,000 people and caused mass destruction of homes as well. U.S. President Joe Biden paid a surprise visit to Ukraine just four days before the first anniversary of the Russian invasion. He pledged Washington's unwavering support for Ukraine. We mourn alongside the families of those who've been lost to the brutal and unjust war. We know that there'll be very difficult days and weeks and years ahead. But Russia's aim was to wipe Ukraine off the map. Putin's war of conquest is failing. Biden has earned a plaque in Ukraine's alley of courage for rallying international support for the war-torn country. The U.S. president responded with a further military commitment worth half a billion dollars, adding to the $30 billion already pledged. Biden spent several hours in Kyiv, then traveled to Poland. <laughs> Now to peculiar sport making waves in Vancouver. It's a familiar pastime, but with a twist. Michelle Gomez gives us a front row seat to underwater hockey. On Sunday mornings, underwater hockey players gather at the UBC Aquatic Centre to practice their unique sport. Some members of this group are on the Canadian women's elite team, which is headed to Australia for the World Championships this summer. Daryl Brambilla has been playing the game for almost three decades. He coaches the women's team. Kind of like water polo and hockey together, I guess you could kind of put it that way. And just like in uh, ice hockey, we have a puck that's about the same size as an NHL hockey puck. And uh, again, you drive it up and down the pool, passing it back and forth to your teammates and hopefully put it in the net at the far end and get the goal. Alita Cricken is one of the players. I really love the three-dimensionality of the sport. So we're training about 15 hours a week uh, in the pool, in the gym, and then about once a month we either meet as a regional group or as a whole team to practice together. Adamita Cardin says she's found an international community through the sport. It's such a new sport that I think you instantly, like I can go to any city in the world pretty much that plays hockey and someone will let me sleep on their couch. And like, I just love that aspect of it. Our province has a long history with the sport. The first ever world championships were held in Vancouver in 1980. They've been on hold since 2018 due to the pandemic. That feeling when you step out on the pool deck representing Canada, it's, it's a lot of butterflies, it's a lot of excitement. It's a lot of pride in wearing the Canadian uniform, wearing that maple leaf on your suit. And although it's not a well-known game, Brambilla says those who play are a passionate bunch. It's really a lasting friendship and uh, almost like a big family in our sport. Michelle Gomez, CBC News, Vancouver. 
the celebrity name behind the new Terry Fox run t-shirts and why everyone is trying to get their hands on one. That story coming up. Imagine yourself skiing down a mountain. Suddenly there's an avalanche. You're buried. If this happens on Whistler or Blackcomb, there's two ways they'd come to your rescue. One is Jason. He's a German shepherd trained to sniff out survivors. Two is this gizmo. It's the latest technology in search and rescue equipment designed to find you probably before the dog can. Jason, search it. Search it. Search it. Go find it. Go dig him up. In this demonstration, a woman has been buried under some snow. Neither the dog nor the man with the new rescue system know where she is. No luck for the dog yet, but the new rescue system has picked up an electronic tone. There it is. Okay. Yeah. There you go, you see it now. All right, she's alive. In this case, technology wins, and here's why. The woman had a special device implanted in her ski boot. Had my reco reflector on my boot here. The people must have the reflectors on their ski boots or the personal locators on the ski boots. Otherwise, we can't find them with it. The rescue equipment sends out an electronic signal. When it gets to within 100 meters of the victim, the device on the boot reflects the signal back better than anything else. The louder the tone, the closer the rescue. The big advantage of the system is that the reflector is, is uh, cheap in production, which means that you can put it, build it into ski boots or ski jackets or backpacks or uh, uh, watches, for example. And we have <coughs> in Europe now seven different uh, uh, ski boot manufacturers that is putting the, ski, the reflectors into some of their models. It's thought the new system will be most useful in heli skiing avalanches or in finding hikers lost in dense bush. Whistler and Blackcomb are the first ski mountains in North America to use it. And in right. case you're wondering if the technology will replace the dog, no. They plan to use both systems. Boy, good dog. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On March 8th, celebrate International Women's Day with Gloria Makarenko at the West Coast Leafs Equality Breakfast. Get your tickets at westcoastleaf.org. And dance away the winter blues with Corleone at Pop Capella 3 on March 3rd and 4th. Backed by a band of Vancouver's best, the Corleone Ensemble will take on your favorite hits. Tickets at corleone.org. And senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us once again. Uh, Joe, turn into a pretty rainy family day out there and now also getting a little windy. Yeah, we're going to get everything in the next seven days, Michelle, and a lot tonight with those winds gusting as we speak. Let me get you through the next seven days, starting with the total snowfall we're expecting just through to the end of the week, a lot concentrated in the southeast, leading to those elevated avalanche risks. Uh, forecast for the next couple of days, 
uh, will still be on the plus side of zero. It's tomorrow night. We'll see those temperatures dip to below zero. Flurries for Wednesday, cold and clear for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And Michelle, watching the potential for a big snow event next weekend. Still a lot of uncertainty. So I will be watching that one closely and keep you posted. Okay, there's something for everyone in that forecast. Something for everyone. Yes. Right, thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, Vancouver-born actor Ryan Reynolds is lending his star power to the Terry Fox Foundation by picking the t-shirt design for this year's Marathon of Hope. Um, of course, he's a BC boy, Canadian um, guy who, of course, is inspired by Terry Fox, as many of us are. Ryan's been participating in the Terry Fox run since uh, second grade, and um, so we're really happy that he's lending his support this year for our t-shirt. Uh, Reynolds wrote on social media that Fox inspired millions in life and in death. The shirts were supposed to go on sale in April, but are now available for pre-sale for the first time ever, thanks to overwhelming excitement about the A-listers' involvement. And that is your news for Monday. Thank you so much for spending Family Day right here with us. For news anytime, go to cbc.ca slash bc. You can also find this program and many others on CBC Gem. Good night. Thank you.